This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Walter Smith Randolph, filling in for Lucy Nopithanchel. This morning, we're talking about adoption and foster care in a post-Roe v. Wade world. Now that the Supreme Court has overturned Roe v. Wade, how are adoption and foster care agencies adapting? Will there be an influx of children put up for adoption? This week kicks off a week-long discussion about abortion rights. All next week, the Where We Live team will focus on Roe v. Wade. But first up, joining us now is Commissioner Vanessa Durantes, who leads Connecticut's Department of Children and Families. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, Walter. How are you? Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. First, Commissioner, tell us what's the current state of Connecticut's foster care system. We know the federal oversight was shed back in March after three decades of oversight. So how is the system doing right now? Um, I believe we're pretty steady. Um, That federal oversight reflected 30 years of an evolution of our child welfare system. And to date, we are consistently decreasing the number of children in care. And in fact, since um, I was appointed in 2019, there are about um, 19.5 fewer kids per percent fewer kids in care. So we are around um, 2,800 children in care as opposed to 4,300 when I um, took this role. Wow. So so, you know, with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, um, do you think it's going to affect the foster care systems across the country? We know that, you know, uh, Connecticut is really becoming an abortion safe haven state, they're calling it. But do you think it might have an effect across the country in states where they might have a six week ban or or other total bans? Our governor likes to refer to Connecticut as the most family friendly state in the country. And, you know, as a result of that safe harbor legislation that just recently improved or increased the availability from, uh, you know, for folks, for moms to come from other parts of the country to Connecticut um, as a safe harbor, we consider ourselves to be here for all families. And if this particular um, uh, decision changes um, just the, the, the flow of people into and out of our state, we're here and we're ready to support families. Right. How do you think Connecticut might be impacted by um, by this ruling? Um, It's hard to tell because, you know, we've always been a place that really um, evolves our services to meet the needs of kids and families that are here. So, you know, when you think about how. Um, you know, you referenced our federal consent decree. When you think about how things were in the late 80s, early 90s, we've evolved to be able to respond to the needs of society today that were different than 30 years ago. So it's hard to tell how this particular decision will impact us. But, you know, we work together with our other sister state agencies like the Office of Early Childhood, Office of Health Strategy and Department of Social Services um, so that we could kind of minimize those gaps in the system to ensure that families uh, get what they need. Right. You, you just talked about working with different agencies. I mean, what infrastructure would you like to see in, in place to help keep more families united? Yeah. So um, for us, it's important to be really clear that um, child welfare, we are not adoption agencies. You'll hear a little bit more of that perspective, I believe, from other guests in the segment. But adoption is one of the um, outcomes for children that do come into care. But our primary focus is keeping children safely at home and that our infrastructure shifts really focus on reunification as being our primary goal to, you know, if children have to come into care, um, they uh, will do so for a very brief period of time and that they are placed with relatives or someone that they know. Connecticut is one of the leaders in the country in relative care with about 44% of our kids in care and with relatives when they do come into care. And if they can't be reunified, we think about um, outcomes like transfer of guardianship and adoption as along along our continuum. But, you know, when you think about the impact to adoption agencies and folks, you know, moms deciding to, um, you know, go to an adoption agency, that's not a perspective that we, particularly in the child welfare space, um, can speak most, you know, most confidently to. Right. So you you mentioned that there are less um, children in the system right now. I wonder how has that uh, impacted your funding? Has your funding increased or decreased or what's the state of that? Our, our legislature and our Office of Policy and Management, led by the governor, um, have been super supportive of our um, 
resources because we know with fewer kids in care, there has to be the requisite services and community. And a lot of those services come through the department. So, you know, we've had a pretty steady um, budget and we uh, have the commitment that, you know, as long as resources are available, we'll continue to be resourced. Um, but as you think about those shifts and how we service families, they probably are best served within their own communities. So um, every, every jurisdiction across the country had to submit a prevention plan under the Family First Services and Prevention Act of 2018. So Connecticut's was just approved a few months ago. And in it, we have what's called the community pathway way of receiving services. And all that means is we've had to identify what are those factors that might make a child more likely to be a candidate for foster care or, or coming into our care. We want to reduce that. So we want to be able to um, reimburse, so the federal government has says, we'll reimburse states for services to keep kids out of care. Um, you know, those evidence-based practices that show by strengthening communities, you strengthen families and fewer kids are maltreated. So that's kind of one of those things that hopefully as they as it takes effect, child welfare will get smaller and community services will get bigger. Gotcha. So so that's what it sounds like is happening in Connecticut. I mean, when you look at uh, states across the country, is, is it similar or is it different? Very different. You know, I, I've, I'm very fortunate to have a legislature and I'm an, uh, an executive and a judicial branch that um, are pretty much in synergy with each other. Um, it, in other parts of the country, it's not like that. I have regular conversations with colleagues um, across the country. I just recently returned from a um, convention with the Child Welfare League of America and another one with the American Public Health um, so so Association, which kind of pulls those other leaders across other jurisdictions together to really talk about human services and you see variability in you know from state to state based on the structure of either their legislature or which you know kind of way they lean. Connecticut is very fortunate to have three branches of government government that seem to be working really well together. That seems to be very, very, very unique. Um, you know, oftentimes in media, you see foster care systems just, you know, uh, being portrayed as being in disarray mm -hmm. and, and having all types of issues. But it, it seems that here in Connecticut that you've been able to to shed that image. Thank you, Walter. And, you know, I'm a lifelong worker within the department. I started my career at the beginning of that consent decree that you referenced. And I, it's pretty much come full circle now that I am at the helm. And I've seen our department go up and down. I've seen, you know, p p people working really hard with limited resources. And now we're at the point at which, you know, things are falling into place. And by no means are we a perfect system, but we partner very well with our other stakeholder groups for the benefit of families, how we measure our outcomes, we should be held to very high standards. We should be held accountable. Um, child welfare is not easy work, but it's one that should be of benefit to kids and families. And, you know, if there is a, mis a misstep that doesn't, you know, paint this picture of a system that is chaotic and in disarray, we went, you know, to great lengths to make sure that this system is one that um, really can support kids and families of Connecticut, depending on, um, especially when they are in crisis. And I'm sure there's always a need for more social workers. But what I want to ask is, is you know, over, you know, these decades that you've been working in the system, have you seen more people coming into the field or less people? Because, um, you know, we know that adoption agencies, on, on the other hand, um, we've seen a number of them close because, you know, mm -hmm. there's been, uh, uh, I guess, a lack of need for them, really. But um, are you seeing more social workers coming into the, into the field or are you seeing less? Mm -hmm. So I, um, that's a, there's definitely a workforce issue in human services in general, social work being, you know, a piece of that. I used to also be an adjunct professor for over a decade with one of our state universities over at Central in their social work department. And you see the evolution of um, interest in our field. One of the things that we are starting to do now is be more um, uh, targeted in our recruitment efforts. So um, just recently, we finished a pilot with the Yukon School of Social Work that identified um, Spanish speaking social work students at the bachelor's level. We have, you know, ongoing relationships with our university partners for graduate students and interns and, and you know, those types of field situations. But this particular pilot project looked at Spanish speaking bachelor's level social work students and introduced them to a child protection track early on in their 
academic career to start really thinking about a field in public service or a field in social work, um, particularly with an emphasis on families who um, English is not their first language and are primarily Spanish speaking. It was so successful. We already have another cohort um, underway. And so that I think are, is one of the nuances as we think about the evolving field of social work, but no doubt about it, there is a workforce crisis across um, health and human services as a whole. Gotcha. Uh, any, any final thoughts on how Roe v. Wade might affect foster care systems across the country? I, I just want to make sure that people know that if you focus on family and focus on um, a, a mom's ability to make choices about her family, you know, when you think about in many situations, if um, a mom chooses to seek abortion care, many times there's already younger children already at home and adding another child to that mix might, you know, make a struggling family fall into a child welfare system. We have to be ready to support all families. And in Connecticut, we do that. And I think we do it really well. So I appreciate the interest and focus on all of this. And I also would be remiss, Walter, if I didn't indicate that Connecticut is also a safe haven state, which means that if a mom um, delivers a baby 31 days or younger, the child can be dropped off at a hospital, no questions asked if there is a concern or a scare or a fear that prevented um, children from being left in unsafe situations when they deliver. So since its inception in 2001, 49 infants have come to the attention of the department through the Safe Havens Act and have been saved from um, an outcome like that. So along with attention to family services here in Connecticut, along with being a state that focuses on a woman's right to choose and having access to abortion health care, we are also a Safe Haven Act if um, a mom delivers a baby and within the first 30 days decides that they are afraid or d don't know what to do. We're a Safe Haven Act and that child can be dropped off at a hospital. So thank you so much for having me on this morning. And um, we continue to want to be a partner in this in this discussion. Right. So Connecticut is both a safe haven and a safe harbor state. You got it. There we go. Thank you so much for joining us, Commissioner. Thank you for having me. From Connecticut Public Radio, this is where we live. I'm Walter Smith Randolph sitting in for Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up after the break, you'll hear from the director of the Center for Child Welfare and Adoption Studies at Illinois State University and the CEO of a pro-choice and LGBTQ adoption agency. They both will give their take on the trends they think we'll see following the overturning of Roe v. Wade. You can join the conversation. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Welcome back. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Walter Smith Randolph filling in for Lucy Nalpathanchel. You can join the conversation. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This morning, we're talking about adoption and foster care in a post Roe v. Wade world. Will we see an influx of children put up for adoption? Will the already stressed foster care systems get any additional help? Joining us now is Doris Houston, who is director of the Center for Child Welfare and Adoption Studies at Illinois State University. Good morning, Doris. Good morning. Also joining us is Molly Ramp Thomas, founder and CEO of Choice Network, a national recognized pro-choice and LGBTQ adoption agency based in Ohio. Good morning, Molly. Good morning. And remember, you can join the conversation. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. All right. So, Doris, um, just kind of respond to what we've heard from the commissioner here in Connecticut. Do you expect more children to end up in foster care? Um. It's, it's really hard to say right now. It's certainly hard to predict. Uh, generally, the data that we review to look at where we are in terms of additional child abuse and neglect reporting, that data tends to be about uh, a year behind. But uh, if history proves us correct, um, certainly the lack of access to an important reproductive health care choice being abortion um, will more likely put additional strain on families. Um, you know, we think of uh, 
the uh, what we many people have in mind is the view of um, women seeking adoption being teen parents who are unmarried and um, and needing to make uh, a choice either for adoption or abortion, et cetera. But the reality shows us that most uh, women who are seeking abortion services actually have children currently. Uh, 60% of women uh, who choose abortion have children. 40% of those women are below the uh, po- are considered below poverty. So certainly, with uh, if there aren't the services needed for women who, for whatever reasons, feel that they can simply not parent another child, if they do choose to keep that child, that will put a strain on uh, family life. And, you know, I would also add to that, that some of the important infrastructure in terms of family support that would be needed for women to keep their children, such as affordable child care, even a family leave for women who uh, need paid time after giving birth. Those are things that we simply don't um, have in place in ways that we should. So uh, with, with that mix, particularly coming out of COVID where families are already under stress and strain, um, I it, it wouldn't be surprising, unfortunately, to have more children uh, being introduced into the child welfare system. And as the commissioner mentioned earlier, even when every child that is uh, where we have a report of abuse and neglect, that does not automatically result in um, a foster care arrangement. The goal would be to try to then put in protective services whenever possible to keep the child in the home uh, with additional resources. However, that does not always happen. So this year, and I would say 2021 due to the additional stressors of COVID, and now 2022 because of more restrictive laws um, regarding abortion uh, across our country in various states really are a mix of um, societal concerns that uh, could certainly lead to more child welfare and foster care involvement. Maybe even inflation in the cost of living, because it sounds like you're saying that there are more uh, families when they they, they already have children and they might have another child. They might have to put that you know child into the system. So maybe like even inflation or cost of living that does that impact it as well? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Families are struggling. Uh, You'll hear and see that our food banks across the country are just overwhelmed with the number of families who are experiencing severe uh, food uh, crises, food shortages, et cetera. Uh, Communities that you hear of the term food deserts, particularly in low income areas. And so um, it's really not a good mix. All of those are part of the important uh, factors that women and men, we don't want to forget about fathers in this discussion because um, whether a child is parented uh, with their birth families or if an adoption plan is made, fathers actually have to be a part of that decision making too. So again, it's it's really a, a difficult time and a difficult mix to reduce women's choices and parents' choices in terms of their reproductive health care. Right. And so, uh, Doris, according to the National Council for Adoption, there's there was a 17 percent drop in adoptions from 2007 to 2014 and went from Looks like 133,000 to uh, about 110,000. Um, that's the latest data I could find. I'm sure you have more current data, but you know, why do you think we saw that drop? Well, again, when uh, women have the opportunity to use um, contraceptive contraceptives um, or contraception, sorry about that. Uh, there's certainly more options now uh, for uh, prevention, pregnancy prevention. Also, um, you know, over the years, even going back further from um, 
the mid 1970s and and really starting in the 1980s society really looks upon single parenthood or women uh parenting children uh if they are unmarried we our social norms and mores if you will have changed over the years so uh there's really not that same stigma that we might have seen uh in past years so uh just the the social norms in increased access to uh, contraception and uh, contraceptive care, forgive me <laughs> for that. Um, but uh, those are some of the uh, reasons why we will see um, fewer uh, adoptions. And then also, if we could add into that, uh, extended family members stepping up, we see more fathers who are uh, comfortable or making the decision to become single parents if mom cannot um, adequately care for the child. Or so there might be a co-parenting situation or also um, or the father having full custody. That's much more prevalent than we would have seen in years past. Yeah, from a personal perspective, I, I got to say that that kind of resonates with me because um, I'm seeing several of my friends who are in their mid to late 30s who are choosing to be single mothers. Um, you know, they might be going the IVF route or, or other routes as well. Um, so I, I, I guess social norm re- social norms really have, have a, a big impact on it. Sure. So again, uh, we don't want to take away from uh, uh, really the the importance of both options being whether that's adoption or whether that is um, abortion care. So those are options that uh, women in our country have had. And it's really part of the um, ability for women to have agency over their lives and and make informed decisions to be able to fit their needs and fit their Hmm. family's needs. Gotcha. Thank you. Well, Molly, can you explain to us how your adoption agency works? Yes, I would be happy to. Um, And I'm going to be packing my bags and heading to Connecticut after this. (laughs) Moving my family. (laughs) Okay. So you're based in Ohio, but you say you're going to visit. No, I'm kidding. I'm (laughs) Right. (laughs) I need to get out of Ohio. (laughs) Um, So yeah, Choice Network, we partner nationwide with independent abortion clinics and Planned Parenthood, first offering deep all options counseling And then um, when a person chooses to uh, make an adoption plan, we create plans that center them. Um, Locally in Connecticut, we're partnered with the Hartford GYN Center, which is part of the Women's Centers. And it's an awesome abortion clinic there for you guys in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, Molly, why is uh, adoption so hard to do? There seems to be a lot of costs associated with adoption and, and long wait lists. Yeah, you know, I think that, Walter, that's the narrative that we're hearing right now is that, you know, adoption is hard to do, that we need to lower cost of adoption as if that is the issue. But the reality is, is there are, you know, we, I've always heard this at 35 waiting families for every one infant available for adoption. I just saw um, last night in the Washington um, Post, they were talking about 45 waiting families for every one baby available for adoption. Some adoption agencies are stating 100 waiting families for every one baby available for adoption. So um, it's not, about the need to make it easier for families or cheaper for families. If we want to have um, pregnant people have that as a real option for them, we need to create laws that support them in safely making that choice. And by taking away the option of abortion is not the way to do that. Um, You know, we're seeing the Supreme Court justices, you know, just talking about how there are suitable homes available for for. Um, children, and there are, but the reality is if women cannot access abortion, the first place they're going to look is a suitable home within their own home. So um, I think, you know, I'm agreeing so much with everyone who's already spoke, Um, you know, Doris is so right in things that she's saying too. Um, But what we really expect to see is that um, in states like Ohio, where the abortion ban, um, really immediately went into effect. I think we got the news about the Supreme Court decision around 
1130 on that Friday by 630 PM, we had lifted the injunction for the six week abortion ban. So, you know, we, we thought we had a couple of weeks to help um, people make plans to, um, you know, just to come together as a community to figure out what to do, but that was taken from us right away. So, you know, what we think is probably about 50% of people will choose um, to navigate or to, you know, cross state lines to access abortion. Um, but what happens with the other 50%? Um, you know, I was listening to uh, Vanessa's in- incredible numbers and the things that are happening in Connecticut. And, you know, at the same time, I looked in Connecticut averages about 7,000 abortions per year, um, where Ohio averages 20,000 abortions per year. Um, so, uh, you know, I just, I think that what we're going to have to do is understand that um, for those who cannot travel to access abortion, what we think is going to happen is that most people are going to be parenting unplanned pregnancies. Gotcha. Um, and so your agency is a pro-choice adoption agency. What exactly does that mean? Yeah, so there are about 3,000 public and private adoption agencies in the United States. Only six of us are really deeply recognized by the pro-choice community, and that's because we hold those values where we kind of are loud and clear about um, our values of all options being there for pregnant people. I mean, we we really truly believe that a woman cannot make a ethical or safe adoption plan without first having access to all options legally available to her. Um, so it's just, you know, in these moments, especially we're digging in really deep to those values. You know, we are working nationwide and locally here in Ohio with funds and providers, um, patient navigation services to figure out how to help continue to have the people who turn to us be able to access abortion. We're also, we have a parenting pro- program called FAB. That, that, that program, we're looking to really increase partnerships um, and invest resources into that to really offer community and resources to those who turn to us who want to parent their child. And then again, just continuing to do our adoption work. Um, You know, not only are we pro-choice, but we're also the only adoption agency in the state of Ohio who has the human rights campaign seal of approval at the highest level. Um, And so that means we are um, open to all families Um, Not all adoption agencies are. In fact, only about one in four adoption agencies will serve all families. So it's just, again, it's it's this moment where we have been ready, but we're just going to be digging in deeper. We're not, you know... I think that we're going to be seeing adoption agencies saying that they're going to be increasing their number of waiting families, you know, to prepare for all the the women choosing adoption. But I am not um, doing that. You know, I think that if we see adoption rates rise drastically, it just means that our community has failed women. Right. And and to remind our listeners, uh, Molly is based in Ohio, which has banned abortion after six weeks. Uh, And it sounds like, Molly, you had less than 24 hours to really kind of um, un, you know, understand what was happening. It, it, it was the the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, and it sounds like by the end of the day that uh, the legislature or the state of Ohio had put that ban into effect. I mean, so what are you hearing from your clientele? Yeah, I mean, we immediately were getting calls on Saturday morning from people who we had um, supported and accessing abortion to say, do I still go to my appointment? <laughs> you know, what do we do next? Um, And so really we were um, immediately just um, trying to connect, you know, get a a, a pulse from what was happening locally. So, you know, talking to local providers, um, really listening to what the funds were needing us to do. Um, But yeah, I mean, it it was devastating for the pro-choice community. It was devastating for people who were accessing services. Um, And so it's just, uh, we had a call uh, Monday morning with, Um, really many of the providers um, and the funds in the state talking about what to do next. Um, And I think people are just doing the best they can right now. Um, But again, you know, I think that already um, access to abortion has been an issue forever, um, especially for the poor, most vulnerable people of our community. And adding in transportation or having to go to another state is just another further burden for them. Right. And and we we kind of talked about it and hinted at it, but I want to talk about it a little bit more. Uh, Do you think that people with unwanted pregnancies that can't access abortion, 
are, are they more likely to keep the child or do you think there's uh, they'll give it up for adoption? Yeah, I mean, what what we are hearing, there was a, a major study done called the Turnaway Study, which was exactly that, that people who were turned away from access to abortion, what's, what did they do? And only 9% of those people chose adoption. Wow. So, I mean, we will see adoption rates rise, but not at the rate that, you know, people in power believe that they will or want, want them to. Um, so what we will see is more people parenting unplanned pregnancies in systems that were already built to not support them. Right. There is a uh, there's a meme going around. I have to bring up the meme where there uh, seems to be some protesters standing outside the, uh, some some rallies with signs that said, we will adopt your baby. Did you see that one? Oh, I mean, they're there. That's been happening forever. Anytime you visit a clinic, you'll see those <laughs> <Yeah>. memes. <laughs> and it's like, you know. That is not um, that th- those protesters and people standing outside those that, that I, I, I cannot imagine that ever a woman has said, well, you know, is that true? I, I, it, that is not how they access adoption services when they are abortion bound. It's because they have thought through their decision. They are, you know, they, we they, we have um We have um, partnerships in place that if they enter the clinic and it doesn't feel right anymore, then they send them to Choice Network. You know, they send them to a partner they trust for that deeper all options counseling and then to create a plan for adoption if that's what's needed. But those are just, you know, tactics to prey on women. Um, I think that but we're going to be seeing more and more of that, you know, just the um, the preying on women. Actually, I think that we're going to be seeing agencies preying on families, too, with this narrative that there's going to be all these babies available for adoption. Um, So uh, and, and, and we just research is not showing that's going to be true. Um, And again, I think that if we really want more people to choose adoption, we should have done long ago, we should have long ago created laws to support that, you know, like, you know, ripping moms from their families happened in um, all the way back to the, um, or ripping children from their mothers has happened all the way back from the days of slavery to currently our immigration practices. So these are the things, these are not, these are women who are not, um, stupid or uneducated, they're seeing what we're seeing. And um, they want to keep their children with them if they cannot access abortion. Um, so the, the, the tactics that, you know, many, um, many agencies are using are not tactics that women are going to, um, to agree to or listen to anymore. Um, what they are going to really need is for agencies to find ways to center them. And I think that's what we're hearing too um, when Doris and Vanessa are talking about um, the community is going to have to evolve if we're going to really want um, women to access adoption at a higher rate. And I mentioned this, uh, Molly, in the uh, pre-interview before we started recording, um, that, you know, I worked in Ohio for about two and a half years before I came to Connecticut. And there were all of these laws that were being passed about abortifacients. Uh, There was the heartbeat ban that was making its way across the country. I mean, what is it like to work in an environment where the legislature and everybody is, is kind of working against what your mission is? I think that, you know, doing adoption work is not, um, you know, it's, it's work that I, um, that I am proud of because we do it in partnership with the pro-choice movement, because I really believe that adoption done in this way is the only way. Um, but you know, it's, it's not easy. I think that, um, there are such great people, though, locally in Ohio that have dedicated their lives to this. So I think it's just really, you know, turning to those partnerships, partnerships, turning to those people. There are, we do have some really great people in legislature here in Ohio. So they're, you know, digging in deep with them. But yeah, I mean, Ohio is not alone in this. There are other states that were immediately impacted. Um, and you're just seeing... Um, you know, I think the community coming together at a deeper rate and trying to um, figure out what to do next. But yeah, Ohio, um, I, uh, one of my um, closest um, friends now, um, they, uh, and a board member of Choice Network, they actually moved to Vermont because they um, are a gay couple raising two children and they, including a daughter, and they know that Ohio is not going to be safe for them. 
Wow. Um, M- Molly, um, you know, so it sounds like there will not be this huge surge in adoption that everyone is kind of talking about, but it seems like there might be an uptick. Are you adding in um, any special counseling or is there anything that you're doing to prepare for that that uptick? The uptick in adoption, I mean, that will always be able to be um, – th- that's an easy fix for us. You yeah. know, we have – Um, We have a small wait list of waiting families. We can always increase that if needed. But as of right now, all we are doing is digging in deeper to that abortion counseling work, that navigation services, um, reaching out to funds, and then also increasing um, and investing in our resources for our parenting fund. But absolutely, for those choosing adoption, we'll just continue to do adoption um, the beautiful way that we do, you know, in partnership with uh, the families um, that find us. Um, you know, uh, but we will be ready. It's, I don't want people to believe like (laughs) that they can't turn to us for adoption, uh, especially pregnant people. Adoptive families already know that, but um, especially pregnant people, I want them to know that they can still access that service through us, but it will not be in a way that is um, pressured or, um, you know, coerced in any way, but that uh, is a true choice for them. And Molly, what do you think about foster care? Do you think that's going to rise a little or a, or a lot? It's absolutely going to, going to rise a lot. I mean, again, I think Connecticut is such a beautiful example. It was so great to listen to the commissioner um, telling the numbers of kids in care, the numbers of um, those that are being reunified, um, and their um, you know support for kinship placement that is happening in Ohio. I mean, Ohio is um, a, a, they work to reunify moms and their children. They also do have a ton of resources in kinship care. We have locally about seventeen or sixteen thousand kids in care, with three thousand legally available for adoption. Um, but again, you know, our abortion rates are much higher than those in Connecticut. So I think locally the numbers will rise. I think you know, nationwide, the numbers will rise too. I mean, the women, you know, when people choose adoption, they're in, they're choosing them for the same reasons that they would enter the system. Huh. So, you know, it, it's lack of resources, it's lack of community and resources are like, you know, I saw, um, I saw a stat that uh, women who choose adoption make about $5,000 or $5,000 annually in their home, um, you know, that they have Medicaid. So they're having, um, you know, their, their health care is not great. Um, they have lack education, lack community, um, lack stable housing. Those are all of the, those, those things that can get them connected to the, to children's services. Um, so, you know, if we want to see moms being able to keep their kids, we're going to have to um, really invest in families and keeping families together. And I just, you know, I can't help but believe that there's no way that's going to happen. I mean, it hasn't been happening. So um, at least not in Ohio. Um, you know, we we were hearing that Ohio had a reserve of money of like $7.5 billion. If that's true, um, why hasn't it been used? Uh, we have families in need today. Um, so I just, you know, I, I really fear a, um, a pre-row adoption world, and I, I fear a pre-row foster care world as too, too. Okay. All right. Um, so Doris is going to uh, stick around for another segment. But Molly, any final thoughts on on how you're going to have to operate and how what the adoption world is going to look like in this post-Roe v. Wade world? Yeah, I think that, um, again, if we wanted uh, more pregnant people to access adoption, we should be creating laws that support them and safely doing so. Um, I uh, really encourage other adoption agencies to um, to understand that uh, taking away access to abortion is not a way to create safe and um stable homes. Um, And I just, um, you know, I I hope that we can um, begin to remove the divide between us. And I think by doing so would be just to um, continue to give resources to moms who are wanting to parent their children and um, continuing um, for those who are in the fight um, to 
help women access abortion services. And then for that small percentage of those choosing adoption, that again, we're um, creating laws that have them or help them safely be able to do so. Molly, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. From Connecticut Public Radio, this is Where We Live. I'm Walter Smith Randolph filling in for Lucy Neville Thanchel. Thanks so much to Molly for joining us. And Doris is going to stick around for another segment when we come back. Remember, you can join the conversation. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Welcome back. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Walter Smith Randolph sitting in for Lucy Nabothanchel. Coming up next week, the Where We Live team will be focusing much of the week on talking about Roe v. Wade. What questions do you have about abortion and women's health in the world we live in now? You can join the conversation. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Today, we're talking about adoption in a post-Roe v. Wade world with Doris Houston, who is director of the Center for Child Welfare and Adoption Studies at Illinois State University. Doris, thanks for sticking around. Earlier, earlier you said, um, you know, we talked about the different adoption rates and, and uh, um, also foster care rates. Uh, what do you think about what some of our, what our, our guests had to say? Um, I am in full agreement with both of um the guests that have spoken earlier. Um, Again, as I mentioned, we certainly can't predict, but all of the risk factors that we know put pressure and stress on families um, is is really turning out to be um, what we would call a perfect storm. So I absolutely agree. And um, if I could also speak to the whole issue around infrastructure, Um, ideally, if we're going to make such huge policy changes that have an impact on families. We want to be sure, even in the realm of adoption, that we have uh, sufficient staffing uh, to be able to support families who do make a choice for adoption. As our speakers mentioned earlier, we're really in a workforce shortage in um, both foster care and adoption. And that's really one area where universities can and should play a role because we prepare future social workers, future uh, adoption workers and foster care workers. Um, I actually started my career in Illinois with the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services and worked in both foster care and adoption before now teaching child welfare and um, and conducting research. So part of that infrastructure that we'll need for those who Uh, want to make an adoption plan are um, qualified, um, educated social workers who can support both families who are choosing uh, adoption and then also adoptive families. There's a lot that goes into preparing an adoptive family. Uh, There's a a process in which we uh, want to be sure that the child's needs are matched with the appropriate family in terms of family size, background, skills, experience, et cetera. So uh, these are the, this is where the role of uh, tri- um, trained and skilled social workers come into play. And then also uh, support mental health counseling for all members of what we call the adoption triangle. And that triangle includes the birth parents who are making an adoption plan, um, and, and, and just helping them to work through potential issues of grief and loss. And then the same thing with the, the child throughout the child's development, uh, having those resources for, for a child who might begin to question their identity because they're not biologically related uh, to a uh, the adoptive parents and then certainly those ongoing supports and resources 
for adoptive families and and helping them to uh, maybe there maybe there have been fertility issues and they're working through their own grief and loss because of that and then what we call just uh, helping families have that sense of belonging for an adopted child helping their extended family members who may not understand adoption and how that child can and should be integrated into the full family so again uh even though um, I, like the other guests mentioned, don't necessarily predict that there will be a huge surge in adoption, but uh, for whatever increases we might see, we do need to ensure that we have the proper, uh, properly trained staff in place. Doris, I can tell you're a fantastic researcher because I asked you one question and you hit all the other questions I was going to ask you. <laughs> I was going to ask you about the trauma associated with adoption. You talked about that. And I was also going to talk to you about, uh, ask you about the infrastructure and you talk about that. We, we only have a few minutes left uh, in the show. So uh, any final thoughts on, on what we can expect to see or maybe something uh, that we're, maybe we're not thinking about, but you as a researcher, you can see it because you said, you know, that perfect storm is brewing. Sure. You know, the one area that uh, it's important for us to keep in mind, too, is the intersectionality with race and ethnicity and low income families. So uh, in the foster care population, which, again, uh, is is, uh, connected to adoption as well uh, nationwide, about uh, 40%, a little more, of uh, children in the foster care system are um, black and brown children. And so um, oftentimes these are um, those, because of those demographics and uh, families of color are overrepresented, we want to ensure that we have adequate culturally responsive resources uh, for those families. Uh, We want to first help stressed families, um, if they can stay out of the foster care system. But even if there is an adoption plan, um, many families will adopt a child of a different race or ethnicity. And so preparing those families to be able to adequately parent a parent a child and the realities that we live in a society where race and racism are unfortunate realities, and we can't gloss that over. So um, as families become stressed, uh, whether they're low income, as well as families of color, uh, we, again, have to look at what we're doing to support those families and those that do make a plan for adoption or those where a child has to go into foster care because they're not safe in their home. We want to make sure that we have the adequate with staff and training to be able to support those families. Finally, I would say the other real concern is the whole issue of privately arranged adoptions. Uh, there's a, there's um, research that shows families are uh, adoptive families and birth families are uh, sometimes connecting on the internet mm. through uh, web-based uh, connections, which really go largely unregulated. Right. Uh, this is a huge concern. There were issues uh, about a decade ago about concerns of adoptive families rehoming mm. children. Uh, and again, this is a whole area that's unregulated. And if families don't have the proper reproductive health care options, they're really uh, at risk for um, for exploitation. Okay, Doris, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and your thoughts on, on this issue. You're welcome. I'm Walter Smith Randolph. Today's show was produced by Tess Terrible. Our technical director is Kat Pastor. Download Where We Live anytime on your favorite podcast app. Lucy will be back next week. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>